Wonderful Wednesday in the Word. What a joy, what an ecstasy, and a privilege and a pleasure for us to come together on a weekly basis on Wednesday nights and walk through the Word on Wednesday in this wonderful Wednesday in the Word. It is our goal, it is our plan, it is our desire that we all collectively learn more perfectly what God's will and God's Word is for His people, His church, His disciples those who dare call ourselves children of God. I'm excited always to share God's word with you. I'm excited now about what's going on at our church and uh, at the Southside Church of Christ here in Orlando. I'm excited about what God is doing, sometimes in spite of us, not all the time because of us. I want to generally remind you that our fall festival is coming up uh, in, le in about a month. We're in uh, October 21st and 22nd. On the 21st, that Saturday, we'll have games and snow cone machines and face painting and game trucks and bounce houses and hamburgers and hot dogs and 360 machines and you name it, we'll have it for our children. And then that Sunday, Andrew Braxton, a great young prognosticator, uh, one of my sons in the gospel, will be coming 
and share with us from Little Rock, Arkansas that Sunday morning. That Sunday morning at 9 a.m. We don't do things on Saturday as much anymore uh, as regards to programs, but Sunday morning at 9 a.m. we have a skit and a program and some singing and our young people will be involved. Tammy Bird's song is putting together our program. It's exciting. Please come one, come all. Bring your children, bring your neighbors and your friends. It can be an evangelistic thrust out to the community. So God bless you. We're looking forward to that in all initiatives and endeavors at the Southside Church. Let's continue our exhaustive study on the parables of Jesus. Number four tonight. Last week we talked about the uh, the uh, ten virgins, five were wise, five were foolish. I was in Matthew 25, 1 um, through 13. Tonight, uh, we pick up the second parable. Matthew 25 is nothing but parables of Jesus. This one, the talents, the parable of the talents, Matthew 25, verse 14 through 30. And of course, next week will be the parables of the sheep and the goat. All of them, the whole chapter is consumed uh, with three different powerful pa uh, palliative parables of our Lord Jesus Christ. The talents, the parable of the talents. God will judge us according to the use of our talents. Now, in this story, a talent was a monetary measurement in the Old Testament, a talent. It was the way a name they used to call a certain amount of money was a talent. It would be tantamount to us saying a dollar uh, in the United States of America now. But it is allegorious and analogous uh, to not only money, uh, which is the story centers around, but our talent and the our skills or our abilities that's given to us by God. Now, he gave them money to illustrate how he's given us skills and ability, and he expects us to grow his money. He expects us to expand the skills and ability and the anointing that he gave each and every one of us. Yes, this money or this treasure, this talent or ability or skills, God has given intelligence and gifts to all of us. All of us have some talent. All of us have some talent. Some have more than others. We, we need to stop this thing about God, God is fair, but he's not equal, okay? God is fair, but he's not equal. He don't bless everybody the same. Uh, some people have more talent than other people. That doesn't have nothing to do with whether God, you got children, you got three of them, one of them, two of them is more talented or gifted or anointed than the other. Don't mean you love them less, don't mean that you uh, would give them less, don't mean their inheritance is less. Uh, in this story, we see that the Lord gave three of his servants different amount of talent, of money. That's what the Lord does with us. Everybody can't handle being wealthy. You wonder why sometimes the Lord didn't make you a multimillionaire? Because you'll go straight to hell. You wouldn't even show up at church. And that'd be the last Sunday you show up. You, Sundays, you'd be in Acapulco. You'd be in... Uh, 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 church and Keiko on Sunday. No, the Lord knows what to give, who to give it to. So in the story, we find that out, that he does not bless everybody the same, but he wants everybody to cultivate whatever he did give you to mature it and grow it. And, uh, you know, not all of us can teach. Lord knows everybody can't preach. And the, one of the knocks I've always had on the Lord's church is, when I first was at it, it's like everybody, no, everybody can't preach. Everybody can't teach. Everybody don't have to give. Everybody can't lead singing. Preach, Brother Leonard. Everybody will not be on the greeting team. It depends on your ability, your skill, your gift, your anointing. Uh, some people, there, you can clean the church, cut the grass. Some people's gift is to visit sick people. Minister like Barnabas was in Acts chapter 4. Some people are encouragers like Barnabas. Acts chapter 4. You, you're just good at encouragement. You may not be able to teach a class, preach a sermon, lead a song. You may not be gifted for leadership, elders or deacons, etc. But all of us can pray and all of us can be a witness for Jesus Christ. So whatever he gave you, there used to be a song, This Little Light of Mine. 
I'm going to let it shine. Whatever little light he gave you. And he gave everybody something. He didn't give anybody everything, but he gave everybody something. Amen. So tonight, let's look at our judicial responsibility to use to grow and mature, invest on what the Lord has given us. Quit worrying about what the Lord gave somebody else. One of the church problems, we have church problems, people are always worried about what somebody else is doing instead of being concerned about what you ought to be doing and what I ought to be doing. Yeah, so there are three umbrellas I operate on the briefly tonight, and the lesson shall be yours. Again, solicit if you have a, uh, a suggestion, or idea, or a question, submit it uh, to our constant contact email, or to me personally, text message, or phone call, or to my administrative office. We'll be glad to entertain your thoughts and your questions. So the three umbrellas we operate on tonight, let's look at the parable first, then we'll look at the people, and then we'll look at the punishment. The parable, the people, and the punishment. The parable centered around this, beloved. Three servants went to meet and visit their master before the master went on a long journey. The master gave them. See, these are stewards, right? Stewards don't manage their money. A steward manages the money of another. And the money the steward manages is always of, of superior person, not an inferior person. So the master made them stewards over his money while he went on a long journey. Uh, he gave them the money of the talents for investment purposes. He explained to them when he gave them the money that I want you to grow my money. Don't be dormant, uh, you know, don't be lazy with my, grow it. And this is, again, allegorically an analogy to us, whatever the Lord has given. He gave you the ability to sing, grow it, perfect it, use it to the max, to the hilt. Now, I can say this. I can't say this about a lot of things in my life. The, the ability he gave me to public speak, I've tried to maximize it. Uh, you don't know how many classes I've taken, how many uh initiatives I've taken to perfect my gift. Now, do I have a gift? Okay, I ask you, does Brother Leonard have a little bit of a gift for gab? Probably, probably. I've always had it. Born with it. Before I was preaching, born with it. When I was a DJ, born with it. When I was running the campus, born with this gift of gab. What I have done, and I'm proud of this, is that I worked hard to grow, invest, and maximize the gift. This is all the parable's about. Maximizing whatever the Lord's given you. Now, he's given you something. He gave everybody something, okay? Maximize it. Now, this is true, some people don't know this. When I was in Tallahassee, 1985, 1986, 1987, just started preaching at the Spring Hill Road Church of Christ. Uh, I'm the in interim minister, I'm not even the full-time minister, or never was a full-time minister, but wasn't even the official minister, interim. So I go to the bookstore, I buy me cassette tapes, we had cassette tapes then, and I, I would be riding around while y'all were listening to Michael Jackson and Prince and uh, Earth, Wind and Fire, and, uh, listen to Confunction and the Shy Lights and the Stylistics. I was, I was, listening to vocabulary tapes. This is a true story. I, I'm trying to perfect my gift. So some people say, oh, you got a extensive vocabulary. I need a thesaurus when you're talking. You know what I did? I would buy cassette tapes. I'm riding the wild. I'm going to work, coming from work or going on a trip. I'm listening to vocabulary tapes, expanding my vocabulary. And all the tapes would do is say words over and over again, give you the meaning of the word, how to pronounce the word, the meaning of the word, and how to inculcate that word into a sentence. I'm trying to tell you, whatever gift you have, I had the gift, still got it, but I was willing to perfect it, work on it, uh, to enhance it, to grow it. And that's what the Lord, this is what this parable is all about. The parable is about, look, he said, I'm going to give all three of you guys some money. I expect you to invest it and to grow it. When I come back, you better have more than what I gave you because I gave you a lot, but when you come back, you take it and you grow it. 
Okay, so he gave one guy 5,000 talents. He gave another guy 2,000 talents. He gave the last guy 1,000 talents. And here's what I love about this story. The Bible says he gave it out according to their ability to handle it. The Lord knows that there are some things he can't give you or give me because I couldn't handle it. Now, I like to think I'm a pretty good preacher, but I'm not a good singer. Now, if he'd have gave me that gift on top of preaching, oh, I'd probably be dangerous. Oh, my God. So he's not going to, I couldn't handle that. I couldn't handle that too much. So um, he gave, the story says in Matthew 25, and it's verses 14 through 30, he gave out the talents according to their ability to handle it. But he wanted them to invest it and make profit or gain or interest on the investment. Now, he's talking about money then, but he's talking about our skills, our intelligence, our ability, our gifts, and our anointing now. Okay? You know what the $1,000 guy did, the third guy? He hid the money, sat on the money, let it lie dormant, and that displeased God. When God gives you something, he wants you to work on it. He wants you to perfect it. He wants you to maximize it. Don't ever go to the grave with potential. Live it out. You even have to take risks sometimes. I'm in Orlando today because my wife and I decided to take a risk. We were secure in Tallahassee, doing well, preaching there 12 years, church grown, church paid for, land makers of land. Now I got to step out on faith. The parable is about, see, for you to make money, you got to risk money. Y'all know that. Even though the story is about our ability, our talent, our skills, our anointing, our gifts, he uses money because money is a universal language. You can't make money unless you risk money, unless you spend money. The one guy said, I'll tell you what I do. I just bury my money. That displeased God. That's two guys, one with 5000 and 2000 They went off invested. They risked it. Investment means risk. Okay, I, these days in my life, I do low risk investments because of my age, but, but you still got to risk your money. You can't put it on your mattress. You can't put it in the uh, trunk of your car, dig a hole in your yard. No, you have to put it in an institution where you can draw and make some interest. So that was the parable about. Then the people involved, the master and the three gentlemen. The story goes, the people involved, the master returns. He asked for a spreadsheet on the money he gave them. He says, I want an accounting of the money. I want to audit the money I gave you. God is watching us. God is uh, begging us and pleading us. The parable is found in Matthew 25, 14, 30. But the people, you can see how many times God wants an accounting of our lives and our actions. That's in 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, that he says that all of us are given to account the things done in this life, whether they be good or whether they be bad. That's all supported in 1 Corinthians 4 and 2, that the two men were praised for their faithfulness. They're willing to be good stewards of what the Lord gave them. You can't be a steward of what he gave me. Be a steward of what he gave you. Maximize your be If you're a greeter, be the best greeter you can be. If you're a deacon and you never will be an elder, be the best deacon you can be. If you're an elder, be the best elder. If you're a preacher, be the best preacher. If you're the sister or wife, be the best wife. Be the best son. Be the best daughter. First Corinthians 4 and 2, the results where God praised the people who are faithful with his gift. He praised those who took it and maximized it. And then conversely, he rejected the one who buried it and let it lie dormant. God expects us to use talents and ability to his glory and his honor. The people there, there are several. The master, uh, that represents God in the story. The three gentlemen represents us. What? Just like last week, are you wise or are you foolish? Just like last week, so are you the one with 5,000, 2,000, and those two went off and grew, and the spreadsheet, the audit looked good? Or are you like the one with the 1,000? You went off and pouted and buried it, took your ball and went home. 
And when he, the Lord returned, he praised the two that took the risk and invested, and he rejected and escoliated the one who buried his gift in the sand. God judges Christians by the use of our time, our talent, and our treasure. If, if you had to inculcate or encapsulate Christians' evaluation sheet before God, your resume before God, what do you do with your time, your talent, and your treasure? Your time, your money, and your ability, your talent. What do you do? Your time, you, you, you can't redeem time, you can't buy time, according to Psalms 90 and 12. Your money is tantamount, your treasure. Malachi 3 and 8, the Bible says, Would a man rob God? And they asked, oh, how have we robbed you, Lord? He said, in tithes and in offering. Yes, you don't want to rob God. Your time, your talent, and your ability, your skill set. Don't rob God. Don't be in a church and you can sing, and you sit there every Sunday and don't say nothing. Yeah, uh, that's in Ecclesiastes 9 and 10. Yes, beloved, we have to always remember and never forget, God judges you on what he gave you. He will never judge you by something he didn't give you. He won't expect from you. I don't expect my eight-year-old grandson to behave like he's 16. I do, not, I do not expect that. Quit expecting your 21-year-old son or daughter to have as much sense as you have and you're 47. That's just ridiculous. If your 21-year-old son or daughter have as much sense as you, at 47, you probably ain't got much. And you got, you got the advantage of backward looking. You remember when you were 21, but they'd never been 47. So don't expect something of people that they don't have. They don't have the wisdom and experience. That's why the Bible said, lay hands suddenly on no man. That's why God don't want a novice in his leadership capacity. Even in the United States, you... You got to be 35 years old to even run for president. <laughs> a, you might be 24 and a brain surgeon, MIT graduate. You might be a biochemist, a lawyer, a doctor, a pharmacist, a, a principal, all at the same time. But if you're 27 years old, you can't run for president. Not because you're not intelligent, because you don't have enough experience. Quit expecting something of people that they don't possess. They're not being given. And sometimes this ruins relationship. You, wife, want him to be something he's never been and would never be. You're a 10 gallon woman, but you married a half pint man. And all he got is a half pint. He, he can't give you 10 gallons. He don't have 10 gallons. Quit expect, God don't expect people to behave in a way that what he has not given them. Now, your job is to discern. I need 10 gallons, and he look like he got a pint and a half. No sirisky. So what I'm telling you tonight, God judges us about what he gave us in three predominant areas, our time, our talent, and our treasure. If he gave you much money, the Bible said, to whom much is given, much is expected. Suffice it to say, whom little is given, little is expected. That's why I love God's monetary giving. So give me 10%. Well, 10% of a million is a whole lot more than 10% of a thousand. See, God is fair, but he ain't equal. He ain't equal. He'll give some people a million. Give some people a thousand. But he wants the same from you. That's what I like about God. And then lastly, we talked about the parable. We talked about the people. Let's look at the punishment. The one gentleman who was lazy, the Bible called him wicked. He was a lazy servant. Uh... He knew that the master would demand an account of his money. The master said before he left, when I come back, I'm going to get a tally. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do an audit. He said, I want to see the spreadsheet. <laughs> he told him that before he left. He knew it. And he still was not accurate to the master's request. Now, God's got to do something about that. He took his talent. He took the money from the one who wasted it. 
and gave it to the ones who made great increase. So if you want to know why some people flourish and prosper more than others, he's taking some of yours and giving it to them. He can't trust you with his money. He can't trust you with that ability. He can't trust you with that anointing. He can't trust you with that talent. He can't trust you with that gift. He can't trust you with that ability. So he takes it and gives it to somebody he can't trust. And then you look at people. That's why we come up with that saying, favor ain't fair. Because God is favor. God, well, why he gave you? It's favor. It's just favor. It ain't fair. It's just favor. So if God punish him and cast that servant out into outer darkness. That's what the Bible teaches. Yes, the parable. A master that represent God. Three men who represent us. And God blessed them according to their ability. Not the same. That's just like us. God, you can't buy your... Some of your children, you might can buy a car. And other one, you can't buy them a car. You got to bless them according to their ability to handle what you give them. Okay? So that's the parable. And then people uh, uh, were... Uh, in this story, you saw what happened, the inner work in his prayer. The master returned. He says... Let me see his prayers. Two of them did well. He prayed to one of them, buried the talent. And then he, of course, meted out punishment. After he praised the two, he cast the one servant into outer darkness because he was lazy, he was wicked, he was indifferent, he was uh, living in apathy. God wants you and I to give us and give him our time, our talent, and our treasure. Maximize it. It may be a little. Maximize it. You may not be as much as somebody else in your eyes or in their eyes. Just do the best you can do. That's what he wants. That's what he expects. And that should be our desire. The parable, the people, and the punishment. That is the parable of the talent. Shall we pray? Father, we're mindful, glad, and happy at this time we spent together studying another parable in your book called the Bible. Help us to maximize whatever you've given us. Help us to not be jealous and uh, uh, evil and lazy and indifferent. Help us not to live with apathy uh, concerning the gifts you've given us. Help us to do our best at all times, and when we fail, Help us to repent and seek your forgiveness. Now, God, bless us with time, talent, and treasure. And help us as a collective body and as individuals to maximize and have more when you return than when you gave us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, be here Sunday morning, Southside Church of Christ, 471 Raleigh Street, Sunday School at 10 a.m., Worship at 11 a.m. Classes for all ages. Please be there at 10. And then we worship at 11 promptly. And if you can't make it for whatever reason, uh, live stream with us on Facebook and YouTube. It's an exciting time to be a Christian. It's even more exciting to be at the Southside Church of Christ. Good night. Be blessed. Always remember and never forget the parable of the talents. Good night.